let's move on. Okay, so we, we got a pretty good biological belt going so far with the levels of organization, the cell. We picked up some genetics along the way. I, I bet you you could tell me what a protein is and a lot of things about it, which is really important. I bet you could tell me what a hydrogen atom is and the atomic number and how many electrons it has, which is one and one, All right? You could probably tell me a bit about water and its polarity and how important it is in chemical reactions. You could probably tell me what anabolic means and catabolic and what that, how that adds up to our metabolism. Not just our metabolism, but a metabolism of all our cellular functions. The sum of all chemical reactions in our body is metabolism. This takes what? Energy. Energy. Energy comes in all forms. It can't be really created or destroyed. It's just basically transferred. Transferred. A crazy universe that we live in. Energy. And I like this word. Listen to this word. Claire, you know what this means? Entropy. That's hard to define. Entropy is like a disorganization that creates energy, uses energy, and, and gives it off. What, what do you say, Claire? What, what's, what's a good word for entropy? Sorry, I, I need to put you on the spot. You never heard of it? Okay. I'm happy then. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just, you know, I know you like this stuff. So entropy is disorganization like the ocean do you see any real organization there i mean the tides you can you know plot your watch by your the tides and what days you're going to go surfing and all that but there's all kinds of energy so you got to think more global here all right and electromagnetic and the way entropy creates energy that's neither lost or destroyed it's used over and over and sometimes transferred sometimes kept to itself so you hear things like exergonic, exergonic, that gives off energy, or endergonic reactions I'm talking about, will take up energy, use energy. So these are big words for these metabolic processes that go on in the human body. And we need these things, enzymes, to lower the energy of activation, to make these things happen organized and make it happen quick. Because we, if not, we, we're looking at disease. And, and unfor not unfortunately, but you should know most enzymes are proteins. Remember proteins made of amino acids that are basically transcribed from those nucleotide pairings of DNA onto messenger RNA into the ribosome so these have to be made and the machinery that does that has to be working very well in all your cells. And it has to survive at homeostatic conditions, body temperature, acid base, right? Amount of water, dehydration, too much of one thing, too much of another. So they're proteins basically. That's one exception is the ribozyme, ribozymes that function um, in RNA, ribosomal RNA. So we're gonna talk about proteins as, I mean, enzymes being proteins. Increase the rate, like how far it goes per millisecond, basically, like miles per hour, if, if that helps you. So the proteins, and these proteins are not changed in the reaction. So what's really important about this is they have to have a very specific shape. Remember that? where proteins can have a primary structure, a secondary structure, and then maybe a tertiary, tertiary or coordinary structure as they mature. So the spe specificity of that shape is extremely important and sometimes held together by things like hydrogen bonds, if you remember those, all right? They technically just make things happen faster. And this is really why. They lower the energy it needs for that reaction to go forward. So really, if, if, if you're asked, what is the main function of an enzyme? You could say catalyst, of course, you could say speeds up a reaction, but how it lowers the activation that's needed for that 
particular reaction to go on. So it spares our overall metabolism, keeps us healthy, enzymes. Yeah, so the energy that's required for the reaction. And, and we kind of get in this whole reaction thing down, what a reaction is. It sounds really chemistry like, and it is, but again, I'll, I'll try to keep this biochemistry as straightforward as possible because it is confusing. And as much as I love it, it's confusing. So a reaction, I'll do it like a textbook way, like and later on we'll, we'll fill these in. Like A plus B will give you AB and maybe a C, something different. So these reactions, and it could go both ways, right? These reactions usually take an enzyme to speed them up and lower the activation. And remember, if you go from like polymer, I'm sorry, monomer to polymer or like monosaccharide, monosaccharide, disaccharide, that would be what? Dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis? Anybody with me? Dehydration synthesis. You got that right. So we're going to lose a water in that reaction, right? That's dehydration synthesis. So always remember synthesis. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. And that's a endergonic. And if you go the other way, it's called hydrolysis, where you add the water. So you're lysing. Think of that. Like if you have AB, you add water and you lyse it. Split it in half and you'll get A plus B. So here's the enzyme and of course the water. So you're going to have reactants and product or products. And these reactions going on all the time. We're going to give you some specific ones. But you already know some. What's a good reaction? This is a reaction that, again, happens in our body all the time. This is the main energy source of our body. Right, if you get ADP, adenosine triphosphate, you with me? Plus another phosphate, it's usually inorganic phosphate. What do you get? Just put ATP. ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So that's that's a reaction that needs a enzyme. Like this one happens to be called ATP synthase. Now, is this an anabolic reaction or a catabolic? Dehydration synthesis, right? Anabolic. And then you can go the other way. And if you go the other way to these two products, you'd have another enzyme like ATPase. And that makes a lot of sense. So we're hydrolyzing ATP. We're lysing it into ADP. And let me tell you something. If I haven't mentioned this already, ATP is like a potential energy, like a stored energy in some ways. But this is really where the energy comes from. Light my fire. The P phosphate, inorganic. Not pi like on March 15th, right? Three, that's not the same thing. This is just an inorganic phosphate plus the ADP. And this is going to be reused. And you could, you're phosphorylating the ADP here. You get that? You're phosphorylating. You hear these words? Hopefully that'll make sense to you. So that's a, that's a big reaction. Building poly, uh, polysaccharides is a big re reaction. Building uh, phospholipids, building proteins, big process, peptide bonds. So, of course, most molecules and most reactions don't have the active, activation energy they need. So you have to add certain things. And this is part of it. They got to think out of the laboratory if you can. You need heat. So heat definitely speeds up a reaction. Of course, it has some negative effects, so you want to keep a homeostatic body temperature, but heat generally speeds up reactions. Don't worry about this one. Let's look at this one. I like this one because a non-catalyzed reaction, the reactant's got to jump over the hurdle, and then they overcome the activation energy is the hurdle, and then everything goes downhill fast. So the enzyme lowers that hurdle. Like, I'm really short, so if you gave me a a stool to stand up so I could see over the fence, you're catalyzing me so I could see better. So that's a little visual there. Okay. So the structure, very important. 3D shape. So remember, those are held together by hydrogen bonds. And pockets are, I'm going to call those sites. Sites. Sites on the 
enzyme. I'm going to call that. Okay. So like if an enzyme looks kind of like this, you may have like an open pocket right here, which one of the sites. You might have one down here too. So the shape of this protein, the way these peptide bonds and these peptide chains are configured is extremely important. All right. So let's say this is lact lactase is an enzyme, a digestive enzyme, lactase, which breaks down lactose, hydrolyzes lactose, and mostly in the small intestine. So lactose, lactose is what's called the substrate for that enzyme. So lactose is the substrate. Lactase is the enzyme. So the reaction is to break down lactose into two other products, which is uh, glucose and galactose, two monosaccharides. So the enzyme specific for lactose. So the substrate is lactose. Is this making sense? Yeah, and they, they always say lock and key. I, my problem with lock and key, like the, the lock being the enzyme and the key being the substrate, is that it's, it's much more fluid than that. It's more like a, a handshake like a specific handshake. That's different every time though. That's the only thing you have to change, change that, the hand and the two hands. But it molds that way. And sometimes the shape has to configure itself naturally into that handshake or lock and key. So picture lock and key being more like a, a handshake because it's, of course, it's not that static. I think you understand that, right? Like sometimes the initial fit is not exact, but it'll have to move to get in there better and by inducing a better fit. So here's some enzyme and substrate, just a general substrate. So two substrates in this case, because this might be a synthesis reaction, right? That needs an enzyme like glucose and galactose making, ultimately making lacto uh, lactose, yeah, the disaccharide. Or it could be multiple products though too. It doesn't have to be just one product. And, and the real tough thing to understand like this, this could be lead to another reaction and then another reaction. And you're gonna need enzymes every time. Rx is not for prescription, it's for a reaction. I use that for reaction sometimes. So most, a lot of re reactions are very long, ongoing reactions that have a, an endpoint that one, one end or another. So again, bonding is important if, if that's what we're doing. You know, we're, we're setting up bonds like protein bonds or covalent bonds, peptide bonds. So the enzyme, of course, helps that all happen, brings it all together. So a temporary enzyme substrate complex. So the, the enzyme is not gonna hang around there all the time, but it hangs around long enough. An enzyme will hang on to, to this substrate long enough. Um, and then once the products are finished, then it could kind of stop. So the amount of enzyme is important. And, it's, and the enzyme is, is based on, or the enzyme output is based on what the products are that, wind up, that you wind up having. Are you following this? So let me, let me let, again, I gotta stop a lot during this one. So, you know, enzymes are protein and they're present in, in your cells, we'll say in your cells or sometimes in the mitochondria, which we'll do in the next chapter. But there's only a, a finite number of enzymes sometimes, like receptors. I like to talk about receptors. So it's kind of similar, they're both protein. But sometimes you have so much product, like let's say excess lactose. Are you guys good with the lactose thing? Because that's a pretty good uh, substrate because it only has two parts, which is easy. So if you have enough enzymes to handle the, the lactose, then everything will be fine and you'll digest the lactose. It'll be, because you can't digest the disaccharide like that. It has to be broken down to glucose and galactose, which also could be converted to glucose. So it's, we want monosaccharides to, to digest. That's really important. 
But what if you don't have enough enzymes? What if all the enzymes are, are used up? And, and it could be genetic, like it, the finite number of enzymes that you get. So sometimes, you know, like, you, have you heard of lactose intolerance? We, intolerance? We might've mentioned this before, but we don't have to worry about that because we're going all plant-based, right? So we don't have to worry about lactose intolerance anymore. Once I finish with Popeyes, I need at least two more Popeyes trips and I'll be good. So you could be lactose intolerant because you, you can't make the enzyme. You follow? That would be a problem. Then, then you're really never gonna be able to um, digest naturally uh, those dairy products because that's what lactose is. But sometimes you just don't have enough. You have like a resistance to lactose. Maybe because you don't have the enzymes to back all the lactose up. And that, it depends. I'm not saying I'm not saying like you're, you know, you're milking a, a cow into your mouth all the time when you're getting tons of lactose. Like it could just be a, a moderate amount of lactose that you could be um, kind of resistant to. I don't want to say intolerant. I want to say resistant, where you can only handle so much lactose. And the symptoms are, are very uncomfortable if if you know anybody that's lactose intolerant. So, so the point is. It's the, the number of enzymes is important. How many enzymes can be produced based on that substrate? Like if there's too much of that substrate, it might not be able to, to handle the reaction. So that might affect the outcome. And it might lead to a disease where, where you have saturated, and that's really the term, saturation of enzymes. So that could lead to a, a fallout in homeostasis. And, and also one of the other things like right here, this product thing where um, the, the reaction may stop. The, and this is a true negative feedback, right? A negative feedback, which we talked about, which sometimes the output of the products has to stop. So there has to be some type of control, right? Some stoppage of the production of the, the enzyme and the formation of the product. Yeah, I think that's, that's the best way to talk about it. If you haven't figured out that they like to use the term or uh, the suffix ace, and that's true, not all the time, though. Not all the time. Like phosphatase removes phosphate groups. Of course, not just on ATP, there's other phosphate. A lot of, a lot of phosphorylation happens inside your cell. Synthase, we know, like ATP synthase. Hydrolase, which helps in the hydrolysis reactions. Dehydrogenase, I like saying that. dehydrogenase removes hydrogen atoms. Like they try to take the um, saturated fats out of fat, so they dehydrogenate them. Kinases, add kinases, kinases, they add phosphate groups, so they're phosphorylating. Sometimes we need to do that to make ATP, actually. Isomerase, like an isomer is basically the same chemical formula, but a different chemical shape. Or well, the carbons may be, like a, especially in organic chemistry, it might just change the shape a little bit. So it rearranges the atoms, maybe to do a function, like stopping a reaction. Or it might be a different organ. Like there might be exactly the same enzyme in the pancreas uh, chemically as there is in the small intestine. But they're isomers, they're slightly different. So their genetics are slightly different, but they, they basically do the same function. So not every enzyme, like I, I like to talk about pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme, just sounds cool, doesn't it? Pepsin, this one even sounds cooler, trypsin. But so some of them have an IN. Um, like renin, I'm gonna talk about renins further in the semester, I like renin. Technically that's an enzymatic hormone. Um, and there's a, another enzyme called pepsinogen and angiotensin, which is basically a hormone. So these have ions at the end, and this is a pepsin. Anybody know where pepsin is, is secreted? I'll tell you where, why it's secreted where there's a lot of protons, a lot of acid. So where was the only place in the body the that's stomach. the stomach? Yeah, but, but think about this. Think about this for a second. Think about the evolution here. Imagine a protein surviving in a pH of three or less. That's a miracle of evolution, right? It's the only place. So pepsin, that, that's a really exciting enzyme. Let's I'd like to talk about that. Because that would never happen with um, something like a, 
a phosphatase, right, or lactase that would never survive. And trypsin's like the opposite. Trypsin's a more of a base. Trypsin's more of a base. Anybody know where trypsin is released? Think about this, right? Here we go. Let's see, smarty pants, if you know how the body works. So you know when you when you eat, and where are we going, Chris? Where are we eating now? You with us? I'm gonna have to go to Chipotle, 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 Chipotle. Okay, Chipotle is fine. Chipotle is fine. So Chipotle, Popeye, you can sorry, get Popeye. some protein there. And the beans and the rice, you can you don't I don't have to eat the animal food there. So it, it goes down my esophagus. The next stop is your stomach. And that's where the acid starts churning. And, and that's where most of your protein is broken down because pepsin is an enzyme that hydrolyzes protein. Yeah, busts up protein. So most of our protein is going to be um, digested in the stomach, not absorbed. It doesn't absorb it there, but at least it breaks it down. So now we can go to the next place. So now the acid, now stomach's got a lot of acid. So the next stop, anybody want to know where the next stop is? Where at, where to? The small intestine. The small intestine. And this is a magical place. This is a, a, more magical than Chipotle actually, Chris. So the, the, the acidic chyme, they call it chyme now, you can't call it Chipotle anymore, sorry. So the chyme comes out of the um, pyloric sphincter, out of the stomach, into a, a magical place called the duodenum. Duodenum, I like saying duodenum, I'll probably say that eight times, duodenum. And the duodenum is, is a place where the stomach contents are going. The gallbladder will release some bile and the liver will release some bile as well into that area. But what's the big fish-like um, organ behind the stomach? Anybody know? It, it makes insulin too. It's very endocrine. Pancreas? Pancreas. 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 So the, the exocrine pan pancreas secretes this trypsin. And, it, and think of this uh, evolutionary situation. Trypsin tries to neutralize the acid out of the stomach and it does a pretty good job. So trypsin is more basic from the pancreas. So the pancreas secretes more alkaline fluid and enzymes. So that's basic, it makes sense, right? Isoenzymes, um, just a little different. So like I said before, sometimes you can have like trypsin it could also be released in other parts of the body. And there's another enzyme that breaks down carbohydrate that's starting in the mouth called amylase. So you could have amylase, like salivary amylase, and, and also you have lipase, salivary lipase too. It doesn't quite break down the triglycerides all the way to fatty acids, but it breaks them down a little bit. Same thing with amylase. This doesn't break everything down to glucose. But in the small intestine and the pancreas, Amylase, saliv uh, amylase is present, like pancreatic amylase or intestinal amylase. And then you have pancreatic lipase. So that, that's my takeaway with uh, the isoenzymes. Like enzymes can be slightly different depending on what organ they're coming from. But you can still call it amylase. Just don't call it late for dinner, right? So they're slightly different and they're called isoenzymes. Iso means the same basically the same. Sometimes mirror images are called um, iso structures, isomers, isomers. So this is cool. This is something we could, we could have a takeaway here. So talking about enzymes and what clinical outcome we can have. Right? So you, you folks that are maybe thinking about or want to be a PA or MD or, or people like me who just want to be a dancer and, and sing, right? We got, we should know some of these things. So alkaline phosphatase, you hear that a lot. You hear alkaline, right? And phosphatase, basically building phosphates. So there's a disease called uh, Paget's, which is a bone disease. So these are blood levels. And I should tell you that they're like a, on a blood test, you see elevated levels. You know, when you get a blood test back and you see like something's high, sometimes it's just a, a transient thing. But if you, if you consistently see alkaline phosphatase, it could be some type of bone issue, alkaline phosphatase or cancer carcinoma of bone. So the bone is basically deep being destroyed and the phosphate is increasing in the blood and the alkaline phosphatase on top of it. This one you might've heard of, 
um, acid phosphatase. Although, you know, the, the prostate basically um, is secreting alkaline fluid because that's another place you want to eat, you know, because your, your urethra is basically acidic because it has urine is usually acidic and the vagina is acidic. So the prostate's job is to add alkaline fluid to the, um, to the semen. But it also has acid as well, like citric acid, because you use, you're going to see this later on, we use what's called citric acid to make ATP for energy. So the prostate can release excess acid phosphatase. And that could be uh, BHP, which is benign uh, prostate hypertrophy. Growth, it's just overgrowth of the cells. Cancer is a different story. Cancer is not just an overgrowth, it's an excess proliferation of cells. Like the difference between um, excess cells is a word called hyperplasia. And this is hypertrophy. So the two different things, one is benign, I mean, it's not cancer. So you look for this, and of course, this is not an enzyme, but there's something called prostate specific antigen, PSA. And really in, in most young men, that should be zero. You know, when you get closer to 70, 80, you might, you might get away with four, you know, four PSA, but that's not an enzyme. The enzyme is uh, acid phosphatase. So, you, so basically you're, you're looking for enzymes that are either gonna, are being used or destroyed in the blood, right? So, you know, if, if you have excess of cancer or you have excess of certain tissues that are overgrowing like, like endometriosis or something like that, you might see different enzymes in the blood, right? In amylase, this is not very common, but if you have acute pancreatitis or even chronic pancreatitis, usually it's from alcoholism or some really weird infection, then you have increased amylase in your blood. So this is kind of rare, right? Aldolase is just specific for uh, muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy is a genetic, sex-linked genetic condition of males. I might've mentioned this before, um, where your proteins that build up your muscle units are not being made right. So they're in infiltrated with fat. So you have an increase in this aldolase, again, kind of rare. You might not see that on a, on a typical blood test, but this, these you do creatine kinase uh, or creatine phosphokinase or CK and CPK because these are going to indicate that some of the myocardial cells are being destroyed uh, and that's a heart attack, myocardial infarction, right? So you'll see levels of CPK or just uh, creatine kinase and LDH too. So this is another one, LDH, lactate dehydrogenase. So lactate in the myocardial cells and also these transaminases, myocardial infarction. Liver makes everything. So hepatitis usually can, has a massively strange uh, enzyme assay on your blood test. So you see these enzymes like these myocardial infarction. Let's just talk about this for a second because this is gonna be important for the next lecture. Myocardial infarction and some of the enzymes, like especially this one, lactate, dehydrogenase, and there's another one called troponin. Troponin actually is not an enzyme. It's a, it's a protein. But this is kind of like a, an MI blood assay that you could see. So let, let's just talk about this for a minute, okay? So we talked about the muscle types, right? We talked about skeletal muscle. We talked about smooth muscle. And somewhere along the line, we'll talk about cardiac muscle and the specifics. But what is... What is the what does any cell need to make ATP besides glucose? What do you need a lot of to live? Really think about it. Oxygen. You need oxygen, so you need aerobic respiration. You need to to break down that glucose. That's anaerobic, but within the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. Remember, we called it that. Did we call it that in this class? No. I thought that was seventh grade. So. That's the powerhouse because it makes so much ATP because of the use of oxygen. And we'll talk about that next lecture. So let's say the muscle cells now, a, a myocardial infarction comes from decreased oxygenated blood supply to the muscle of the heart. 
So they call that ischemia. That's low oxygen contact. So ischemia, and that injures the cells. They basically start to fall apart to the point where they can't depolarize, they can't function, and then they just become necrotic and then and they have an infarction, death of the tissue. So you really, your heart will struggle to do anything it can to, to contract, to get your cardiac output, right? So it can't use the oxygen so well. So it's gonna go for anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration is gonna try to make ATP without oxygen. So do you ever work out like you do like, um, you know, a couple of 10 reps for your, your biceps, right? What, what is that acid that builds up in your, your- Lactic acid. Lactic acid, right. So imagine the heart having lactic acid and that's what happens because it's gonna try to use glycolysis and, and fermentation and lactic acid cycles to, to make ATP so it could contract the muscle. So you look in the blood and you see lactic acid there or lactate and the enzymes thereof. So you could tell different things that are going on in the body based on the enzymes. Liver enzymes. Professor, can I ask a question? Sure. In relation to that. So you know how carbohydrates break down into pyruvates when you're in the anaerobic energy system? Anaerobic, yeah. Yeah, is that considered a substrate because it produces lactose? Or is that is that the lactose the substrate because it removes oh, no. the pyruvate? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Not, not really. Not really. That's, okay. a good, that's a good question. Yeah. But there's a ton of enzymes in that pathway. There's probably about eight or nine enzymes that basically phosphorylating things and making different molecules based on glucose. But that's a good question. That's true. But it's not the same thing exactly. Yeah, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. In fact, you know, lactic acid can be converted to glucose ultimately. And it's a really long reaction. Uh, again, we're going to have to really go slow with that, but that's a really good question. But it's not exactly the same thing. Very good. So what are we talking about now? So control of enzyme activity and the, and the influences. So temperature it has to be homeostatic. You know, of course, the, the higher the temperature, the faster the reaction, but of course you wanna stay in that range, right? Or 37 degrees centigrade. pH of blood, you know, 7.4, right? Or a compensatory range of 7.35 to 7.45. But let me be clear, this is where it needs to be, or else it's gonna be acidic or alkaline. And then we have these cofactors and coenzymes. Now, now we got, these are really cool because now you're talking about vitamins, especially B vitamins. And you have all these other cofactors like um, a calcium can be a cofactor. Iron is a really important cofactor in or making of ATP, really important. Iron, maybe magnesium, copper. So they have stimulating effects or inhibitory. Depends on the product, right? Some enzymes technically can slow down a reaction if it, if it needs to, if that's homeostatic. So of course the concentration of the cofactors, the pH, then the concentration of the enzyme and the substrate. But again, if you have so much substrate and not enough enzymes, this substrate will go to waste and it'll build up. And then you may have some inhibition of the product. So enzymes are only produced in a finite number. Not, it doesn't react to how much substrate is made there. I mean, it can do that evolution wise, that could happen if, if you're constantly bombarded with a new substrate you, or your body, our body over thousands of years will evolve the, that enzyme, like something like pepsin. But for the most part, if you run out of enzymes, substrates cannot be broken down at all. It can't, it can't happen, or if it does happen, it's in a very, very long period of time and not in a homeostatic way. So they increase the rate of reactions, but of course you don't wanna destroy the protein right, with extreme temperatures, right? Above that you know, body temperature. Did I say room temperature before I meant body temperature? I hope I didn't say that. So at this point, if it goes way above, the protein will denature. That's where it loses its shape. and. Then those hydrogen bonds will be destroyed. 
kind of like putting an egg in a frying pan where that clear protein albumin will turn white and change the way it reflects light because of its change in shape. So the tertiary structure is very specific. Just showing what could happen with the enzyme activities going up from low temperature to your body temperature. But then as it goes up, it's destroyed and the en enzymatic activity goes down. So enzymatic activity here on the y-axis and your temperature rising down on the x-axis. Right up. So of course, enzymes inhibit the peak activity within a narrow pH range. We know the pH range. So we want an optimum pH for that enzyme. Of course, most enzymes operate at 7.4, except for pepsin, which is in the stomach, which is operating very low. It could even be zero because of all the HCL, all those protons in the stomach. So again, change the conformation, change the function of the enzyme. So whatever the fluid is there, like stomach, right? Very acidic. Saliva slightly, slightly acidic. Small intestine tends to be more basic, more alkaline, right? Alkaline. So, so a takeaway here of like where the, the acid is. Um, so pH range, right? Like uh, homeostatic pH range. We have... Um, and we'll just say 7.4. Let's just use 7.4. That just works better. So if your pH of your blood, let's say blood and your fluids overall, is above 7.4, is that alkalosis or acidosis? Alkalosis. alkalosis. So that's alkalosis. And if it's below 7.4, technically that's acidosis. So your body wants to keep that balance. So let's say you have a sick person. Um, and a, a, a stomach virus or a lower intestine virus. So if it's in your stomach, most likely you're gonna vomit, right? I hate to get, sorry, I, I, I'm not hungry right now, so I'm good. So if you, if, you, if you vomit, what are you losing, acid or base? Acid. Acid, so, you, so your blood might tend to go a little bit towards the alkaline side, if that's your um, body state. Now, what if you have the opposite, not the opposite, but what if you have diarrhea, which is extreme loss of mucus and intestinal fluids? Would that tend to make you more acidic or basic? Acidosis acidic. or alkalosis? More acidic. more acidic, that's right. That's right, because you're losing more bicarbonate. You're losing more hydroxide because there's more base below the stomach, especially in the intestine, where the environment tends to be a little bit more alkaline. And that's why the, the blood is 7.4, by the way. And that's slightly alkaline in a laboratory, right? In the true pH scale. So that's a, that's a takeaway you should have. I mean, the, the blood is slightly alkaline because there tends to be so much hydrogen ion involved in so many reactions. Are you hearing this? Reactions in your body, multiple involved hydrogen. And why is hydrogen so, um, this goes back to like the first lecture, I hope. Like why is hydrogen so special? Um, when it comes to its reactivity. And it has something to do with its atomic number. It only has one proton because it gives away its other electron. Yeah. And what if it what if it becomes negatively charged? Then it becomes like an electron. So this is involved in so many energy reactions. When you go from, uh, again, I'm not gonna talk about oxidation and reduction yet, but there's these reactions that, that jump, they oxidize, they reduce. Just exchanging that stupid electron that hydrogen's carrying that gives off enough energy to make ATP. It blows my mind, that little thing, right? And that happens in the mitochondria, which we'll see next time. But I'm trying to get there without being too confusing with that topic. So keep that in mind, that, that, that electron. Because like, like she said, uh, Jordan, she said that the... Um, Hydrogen only has one proton, but it also only has one electron too. And it's very um, expendable in a way, I suppose. So this is a nice little graph just to get you to look at graphs. I don't know if you're doing this in lab and labster, if you're using labster, like hamster, labster, 
So you have enzyme activity, like we saw before on the y-axis, and the pH is increasing. So I bet you if I, if I took this away and gave them, you could tell me which ones are here. I gave you a multiple choice or a matching, right? This is operating at a low pH. So this is going to be what? Pepsin. Not Pepsi Zero, like I'm having at Chipotle today, Chris. Pepsin is the enzyme. Then you have this one, which is kind of a large range. Actually, it can be acidic. And it can go up above eight. So that's your salivary amylase. I'm just saying amylase. So saliva has it. And this one is operating at extreme base. So this is going to be your trypsin. Who knew? Right, so pepsin, stomach, right? Trypsin, pancreas, below the stomach. Intestine. Right, this could be saliva here. Make sense? Proteins, enzymes, polypeptide bonds. So coenzymes are little helpers. Little helpers. They don't have to be molecules. Um, they are, and there's pretty good molecules that I think the research should really take off on something like an enzyme co or coenzyme that's based on a vitamin, like vitamin B, your flavonoids, and your nicotinic acid. So small molecules are the, what you're going to see is something like FAD. I'll just say like a flavonoid written like that, FAD or a nicotinic acid, which is nicotinamide, NAD, just to get used to seeing that. So organic molecules, of course, these are water-soluble vitamins based on vitamin B, B vitamins, niacin, riboflavin. So what do they do? They transport hydrogen atoms to other small molecules between enzymes. So if, if this like grabs a hydrogen ion or two, this one grabs one, that's actually oxidizing hydrogen. And it's reducing the NAD and FAD. I'm just showing you this now. I'm, not, I'm going to talk about this probably next time. But see how this happens. So the hydrogen gets added and taken away to this coenzyme. And it really helps the energy scales, which you're going to see. Just to give you a little um, preview on that. So cofactors are more uh, inorganic metals, right? calcium. I think you really have to know that calcium has to be homeostatic in our blood all the time because it can really throw off many reactions. And magnesium, uh, manganese, copper, and zinc. I have five kids. I named them all, all these things. So these are coenzyme metals, right? And technically iron should be in there as well, but only in one or two places. So these are really important being able to help the enzyme do what it has to do, and that's to catalyze a reaction. So it helps with the binding, of course, really. The, like think, again, it's not an enzyme reaction exactly, but when hemoglobin binds, I'm sorry, when, when oxygen, O2, binds to hemoglobin, it does it via iron. It helps the binding. So th this is much more widespread, um, of course, because this is many enzymes in your body with these cofactors. Yeah, very specific too. So they may have a different site, an active site on the enzyme. So the, again, this is kind of like a lock and key, but I like the handshake better. Or sometimes the site is right between for the cofactor. That could be you know, manganese or calcium or copper, okay? Inorganic, so you have the organic part is the enzyme. The substrate could be organic as well, obviously, but the cofactors are usually inorganic. Now the vitamins are organic, the coenzymes are organic because they're vitamins, right? And we'll talk more about those. Enzyme activation, um, again, particularly in the digestive system, and that's good to remember because we're gonna talk about the dig uh, uh, digestive system. So they have inactive form of an enzyme is called a zymogen. So 
So this is a good example, uh, pepsinogen. So pepsinogen in itself is not an acid or it's not a, a, a full enzyme. It's not living in acidic environment. And most of the time it's in the blood. So pepsinogen has to be converted to pepsin in an, an acidic environment. So if pepsinogen is exposed to acid, it's gonna create pepsin. So what do you think that acid is? Anybody know? That's in the stomach, HCL. Right? Yeah, hydrochloric acid will stimulate the pepsinogen to produce pepsin and additional enzyme. So pepsinogen is an, is an enzyme and so and then it turns into pepsin in the acid? Yeah, that's exactly what okay, happens. Okay. So um, usually you, you don't want constant acid in your stomach being pumped, you know, because basically what's acid? It's a proton, right? Right, it's a proton, it's, a, it's an H plus. So the protons are pumped into the stomach cavity or into the cells out of the cells of the stomach in the pits and this is a reaction to something coming into your stomach of course right something it doesn't have to be protein so there's a stimulation hormonal change before all this happens it's called gastrin which will secrete hcl hydrochloric acid so all the all the protons are pumped into these cells and then they'll um, activate the pepsinogen to be converted to pepsin. So that's a reaction, right? That sounds like a reaction straight up, right? You get, like Chris said, you have the enzyme uh, pepsinogen, which is much more water soluble. It, it, it's not gonna survive in, in the acid environment because it's gonna be converted to pepsin, which will survive and continue. So protons are really being pumped into the stomach to make HCL. Like I, we might've talked about this, like when we went to Chipotle and I had uh, heartburn, right? Heartburn, which is too much acid in my stomach. Sometimes it causes GERD, which did you ever hear of GERD? If I had a daughter, I'd name her GERD. So the, the, what happens with GERD, it's called gastroesophageal reflux disease. So all that acid is gonna come up through your diaphragm and up into your esophagus, it's a horrible condition and it burns and it's, it's, it's dangerous actually. So then you have to take a proton pump inhibitor like Tagamint or what was the other one? Tum, 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 tum. Well, that was more sodium bicarbonate though. That was more sodium bicarbonate to just neutralize the acid. But something that like Tagamint, I believe, and there's other ones. Somebody told me the name last time. The, the, the uh... Pepto-Bismol? So sometimes you take that. What is it? Zantac. Yeah, Zantac, that's another one. Yeah, right. So they, they stop the protons, they, they stop the acid from being produced. They're not just neutralizing it. Crazy. So enzymatic reaction. So sometimes the enz enzymes can overwork, like excess pepsinogen could be a problem, but the bigger problem is the HCL, All right? Yeah. So talking about phosphorylation, we're not gonna go too far into uh, dephosphorylation and phosphorylation until we get to the, the um, Respirations, I think. Yeah, we'll keep that there. So enzymes, like I mentioned, can be controlled, inhibited. And some enzymes, yes, they can be degraded, of course, naturally degraded. But for the most part, always remember enzymes in, in most of our reactions are not really used up. They're, they're broken down and, and recycled. They're constantly being used in a finite number, though, in a finite number. So most of them are reused. They're not technically, they're not destroyed in every reaction. That's kind of important. Like some neurotransmitters can be destroyed, which is appropriate, you know, to break down some amino acids. Uh, not amino, the neurotransmitter, sorry. So, but enzymes in most reactions in certain parts of the body are, are reused. Okay. So the concentration increases in substrate, but the enzyme can come become saturated. That's basically what I talked about before. So all the enzymes in that compartment or in that solution or in that cell are saturated. So it doesn't matter how much uh, substrate you have. It doesn't change the outcome of that reaction. And that's pretty much what I said before. Yeah. Again, reaction rate going up, concentration. 
goes up, but somewhere in here, you run out of enzymes. So it stops, it doesn't continue to go up. It goes, it flatlines at a point of saturation, which is completely appropriate. Sometimes reactions are reversible. And this is a really big one. This is a big one. This could go even further, right? This could even go this way. It can go another, I'm gonna to have to put this here, even though this is more about blood and acid base, but this is gonna give you your HCO3 minus plus hydrogen. So this is really important. This whole reaction here is important in acid base control in the blood, right? If you have a lot of, this is bicarbonate right here. This is bicarbonate, which is a base, strong base. This is the hydrogen ion, which you know now is a strong acid. So this is carbonic acid, which is kind of a weak acid that can buffer as well. So the hydrogen will be buffered by the bicarbonate ion. Remember, tum, ta -dum, tum. And you get the carbonic acid and that could break down either way. It can go either way. But remember this reaction because this is really one of the more important reactions in the human body right here. And basically it's maintaining your pH balance. And the enzyme is carbonic and hydrate. So I really know this one. Right, the law of mass action is just controlling a homeostatic production or homeostatic level of something by, and this goes on everywhere. So let, let me ask you this. This, this, this is what interests me and I think you should pay attention here. The more carbon dioxide you have in your blood is gonna drive this reaction this way. And usually the more carbon dioxide you have in your blood, the more hydrogen you're gonna have in your blood. So hydrogen ion. So the more carbon dioxide, the more acid. And more likely you're gonna have acidosis. So let's get in your face again. So what, how could you have too much carbon dioxide in your blood? Think of respiratory condition. A respiratory illness. Lack of uh, respiration. Respiration yeah. is poor. Yeah, that's right. You're not, especially expiration. You can't get the air out. Your obstructive uh, condition it doesn't let you get the carbon dioxide out. So it builds up in the lung sacs and it ultimately builds up in the blood. And because of that reaction with the carbonic anhydrase is the enzyme it's gonna increase the hydrogen ion, which decreases the pH, which gives you an acidosis. So a condition like uh, COPD, have we heard of this? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, especially emphysema, will increase the uh, carbon dioxide in your blood because you can't, the, the walls of your, your lungs, they're called alveolar walls, where the, the oxygen carbon dioxide is supposed to diffuse and this gas exchange where the carbon dioxide is supposed to go out, but the carbon dioxide gets trapped because the alveolar walls are being destroyed by a condition like emphysema. And it's usually due to smoking. Smoking, not 100%. Do people still smoke? Do people still do that? They, they vape now. They vape. That, that's probably bad too. I mean, mean chemical-wise, that's it's worse. I don't know if it's going to cause emphysema the same way, but if it has the same carbon monoxide in it and it has the same toxins that cigarette smoke has, you're in big trouble if you're vaping. Vaping, right? Vaping. It's becoming a trend in like my generation. Yeah, no, I know. I did notice that actually. So some people, it's, they hide it because it's easy to hide. It has a lot of metal. That aren't good for your lungs. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, so that's, that's going to be a, a, a problem, don't you think? So again, that's gonna create an enzymatic problems within your lungs, just to get that carbon dioxide out. My dog doesn't like the idea of vaping, that's for sure. So we good with carbonic anhydrase for that reaction. So remember that reaction, take a screenshot, there you go. Okay. So most reactions again are linked to multiple steps. 
and then to get an, a final pro product like excess amounts of ATP. We know ATP, just phosphorylating ATP with um, ATP synthase is very straightforward. But within the mitochondria, you're gonna see there's multiple, multiple steps to get to that final product, which is basically ATPs, many with carbon dioxide actually is one of the byproducts and heat released as energy. So energy part of uh, the entropy of all this and the hydrogen ions being reduced and FAD, NAD being oxidized and reduced, giving off that free energy. Um, you're gonna wind up with CO2, excess heat and water and ATP, which you'll see. So that's gonna be the takeaway from that. So there's initial substrate, of course, which could be glucose, could be pyruvic acid, could be lactic acid, lactate, and then the final product is a food. Hold on a second, let me stop this talk. That dog's not scared of me at all. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what I say. Okay. So it could be branched, of course, and then lead to other reactions, but we're not going to get that much into it. Like I said, outside of cellular respiration, using uh, glucose to make ATP, we're not going to talk about too many different reactions. But you see how you take a fork in the road and have an F product of different final products. It could be the same product. But some enzymatic reactions are a one direction. Some of them are reversible. And that's important to know when we did that chemistry a bit. So end product inhibition. So it has to stop. That, I think that's, that's the, the stop point where, and again, it's negative feedback. And one branch in that enzymatic reaction has to be stopped so it doesn't keep going in excess products because that would be disease forming. So an allosteric inhibition is the process where the product binds to a different enzyme at the location and changes the active site. So that's what the takeaway is. This allosteric inhibition is stopping the enzymatic reaction and stops the final outcome from increasing, right? Again, it's hard to give an example exactly, but say too much lactase in your, in your blood would be cause you to go out of homeostasis, too much pepsinogen would cause you to go and go out of homeostasis. Too much trypsin, too much LDH, too much, too much acid phosphatase or something like that. So homeostasis, of course, always comes back into play. So the allosteric inhibition will stop the product from accumulating by inhibiting an enzyme at a certain point within the reaction. That's pretty magical. Okay, now errors in metabolism. Basically, we're talking about uh, mutations, right? Mutations here, something that went wrong in the machinery of transcription that built the protein to begin with. And it could be located on a single gene. So, you know, many conditions are treated by treating the lock, loss of the enzyme, All right? And there's a pretty good list coming up, I think that some of you may have heard of. So basically, if the enzyme is not working, you have to either avoid that substrate. Does that make sense? Avoid that substrate, kind of like lactose. Except some of them could be much more deadly than a lactose intolerance. Not to belittle somebody with lactose intolerance, but some of it could be a problem. There's a couple of horrible conditions that you're gonna see that could be genetically linked to a, an enzymatic mutation or error. Yeah diseases. All right, so we'll go to that table in a minute. So this is a faulty enzyme in a reaction. All right, now if it's genetic, where that's going to be kind of constantly transcribed, whether it's a latent change, which means like you, you might not have been, you might not have had it as a young person, but eventually it expressed itself as an older person. I want to do a neuro, you'll see some, some of those kind of conditions that have more latent onset or the, the expression changes uh, sometimes as you get older, sometimes not that old either. You know, it could be in your first 10 years of life, it could be in your, your 40, 
uh, 40th year of life. So here's some of them. Um, the metabolic defects. So most of these, and you look at these, they all could be genetically linked mutations. So I, have you ever heard of this? PKU, phenylketonuria. You might have read this, like, like, because there's warnings on uh, food products or sweeteners sometimes that have gum that has um, phenylalanine in it, which is an amino acid. So it increases the this acid and it can cause brain problems or seizures, right? So this is, has something to do with affecting your brain, this excess acid in the brain because of a faulty um, enzyme. And melanin, albinism, is a problem basically in what builds the pigment. It's a protein called melanin. So albinism, of course, no protection from UV radiation. You can barely look into the light day because you have no melanin within the backs of your eyes that kind of harnesses the, the light. So of course they're gonna be susceptible to skin cancer. Maple syrup disease, isoleucine. Yeah, maple syrup disease. With, it's, they found this out because of the urine, very young children. So this is lack of the enzyme that breaks down these proteins that contain these three amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Again, cognitive, mental degeneration, brain, and death, of course. Homocysteine or homocystinuria, again, you can't break that down. You're in big trouble with this. If this happens, buildup of homocysteine. Again, back to the brain and visual. Homocysteine is also a amino acid, cysteine is the amino acid that um, people who eat a lot of animal foods build up homocysteine, which can augment some atherosclerotic problems or cardiovascular problems as, as well. So that really should be put on there, cardio V, cardiovascular issues. Um, lactose intolerance, you've heard of that. So you can't use your lactose, so you have too much mucus, too much uh, flatulence because you can't digest that lactose. Very, very uncomfortable. So you can't, you have to avoid lactose or give something that mimics the enzyme. So, so you can live a little bit more comfortably. Glucose 6-phosphate. Now this is a, uh, one of the byproducts of breaking down glucose anaerobically in uh, glycolysis and Gierke's disease. So accumulation, too much glycogen in the liver. Too much glycogen in the liver. You can't release it either. You can't hydrolyze it. You can't use it, which is gonna give you hypoglycemia. If you can imagine, you know, you think of somebody with excess glycogen, they should be able to break down that glycogen because glycogen is our storage form of glucose. So of course the liver is gonna get enlarged. This is rare. You don't hear this too much, but you never know. A glycogen phosphorylase deficiency, same kind of thing, except now it accumulates in the muscle. Because the two places that you store glycogen or glucose is in your liver and skeletal muscle, mostly. So muscle fatigue, skeletal muscle fatigue, if you don't have the enzyme. Lipids, um, Goucher's disease, right? Lipid accumulation, liver spleen enlargement, and also cognitive brain generation. This one is very bad, Tay-Sachs disease, genetic. Um, one in four, if, if one of your parents has this, you, you know, you really got to be, have this tested or, or before the child's even born, something like Tay-Sachs disease, faulty breakdown of lipids, which could really affect your neurons in your brain. So this is very bad, um, a death sentence. So they do a lot of genetic testing now for Tay-Sachs and it runs in certain families from certain parts of the world, right? So again, the enzyme for um, breaking down the lipids. Hypercholesterolemia. Whenever you see emia, that means it's in the blood. So like hypercholesterol is much, too much cholesterol in the blood. Now, by now you should have an idea why cholesterol is good 
you know, not good for us to eat. I'm just saying we need cholesterol in our cellular membranes for strength and flexibility. We need to synthesize enzymes and uh, not enzymes, hormones in our liver, like estrogen, cholesterol, aldosterone, um, testosterone, all those steroids that are all based on cholesterol. So those steroids are lipids and they're all based on cholesterol. But in high doses in your blood, high blood cholesterol, this is really gonna destroy the inner linings of your blood vessels, especially if you have a lot of what's called LDLs, which are low density lipoproteins, which carry a lot of fats and cholesterol, low protein, that's why it's low density. And your cells, like your macrophages, which by now you should know are those big eaters that are inflammatory, causes more inflammation. So you have an inflammatory response to cholesterol and LDL and it destroys your inner linings of your blood vessels. And then you start to build up plaques and then it calcifies and gets hardening. So atherosclerosis is plaquening, plaquing of your blood vessels especially a coronary ones, coronary, coronary arteries are the arteries that feed oxygenated blood to the heart muscle, like we've mentioned before. So this could lead to uh, an, an ischemia. It could lead to an injury and then ultimately infarction. Then you'll have those enzymes released from the actual heart muscle, like LDH and CPK, CCK and CPK, sorry, CPK and CK and proteins like troponin, which are indicative in the blood of myocardial infarction. So of course, hypercholesterol anemia uh, emia has to be uh, treated to lower cholesterol. That could be a tricky one because you know, there's gonna be a lot of side effects to any medication that's gonna take away your, your cholesterol, right? How are we doing so far? We need a break? Break time, you think? Break time? We're here to like 5.20 or something. Need a break? You guys going to go out and vape right now? You folks? Bioenergetics. Now it's getting exciting. Whole new topic, basically. Flow of energy and living systems. So, again, stored energy is ATP, but we have to make ATP first to store the energy. So this whole entropy, this whole flow of energy, the law of thermodynamics where it's not destroyed or created, transformed has to eventually affect our cells and building ATP and using ATP and then using more energy, adding more energy. So let's take a look. This freaks me out. You ever see this? how this happens. What is this called? Anybody know? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Oh my God, this freaks me out. Photosynthesis. What have I been talking about? We, what do we use for our cells? Glucose and oxygen. So this guy or girl takes the energy from the sun, from the sun. It's a massive ball of protons pretty much hydrogen. Then it's going to take CO2, which is, you know, they consider that a greenhouse gas, but the plants need it. And then we put some water on it. And then we get the glucose from the plant. See how this works? That's a pretty, pretty interesting reaction. And then we're going to bust up the glucose with uh, glycolysis, with aerobic respiration. And then we're going to make ATP in our mitochondria, right? It's crazy. It never ceases to amaze me. It says two laws of thermodynamics, of course. Energy is lost to transformation of heat in the form of heat. So there could be free energy available for another reaction. Here's the word, Claire. Entropy. Entropy, degree of disorganizing disorganization. So as energy is transformed to one thing to another, it's going to increase the ocean, right? So endergonic reactions, like I mentioned at the beginning, which energy is added, and that could be free energy added to a reaction, 
And then an exergonic, like a lysing or hydrolysis reaction will give off energy in one way or another, heat or that inorganic phosphate that's hydrolyzed off of ATP. So endergonic input of energy, input of energy. And of course, you're gonna need an enzyme for a lot of those reactions. So the products will contain more of the free energy. So it's used, energy is used in the reaction to form the products. So the reactions are at a greater state of entropy, free energy. And the products are more, we could say more stable. How about that? More stable, less volatile energy. I mean, entropies could be also seen as volatility, which is good for the energy. Might be bad for the product though, depending on what we're looking for. Look at this, plants need the energy from sun. CO2, which is stuff we don't want in our body. We don't even want that much of it in the atmosphere. You know, the atmosphere, like the atmosphere, just think about the atmosphere for a minute. And we're at sea level, right? Right, we're here on West 91st Street, right? We're, we're at sea level, right? So the atmosphere, the total pressure in the atmosphere is about 700, and 62 millimeters of mercury, right? What do you think is the, prob the most abundant gas in that atmosphere right here at sea level? What do you think the gas in the atmosphere is, most of it? Anybody know? Anybody on Jeopardy? It's nitrogen actually, but nitrogen probably about 70, 78%, I think. So I don't know, you could do the math and see how many millimeters of mercury that is. So this is not soluble in our blood, right? But guess what? The plants use nitrogen, of course not nitrogen gas directly, but they use nitrogen as fertilizer to help them grow and use the CO2. And then the other gas is, anybody know? What's the really important gas that's like 21%? It's gotta be oxygen, right? It's gotta be oxygen. You guys can hear me, right? Anybody there? Yeah, I hear you. Sure you used the right chemical in that vape, guys? Or you used something else? So this is 21%. <laughs> so 21% of the, uh, the oxygen in the atmosphere is like 159 millimeters of mercury, say. So that's pretty good. That's a nice concentration. But carbon dioxide is like less than 0.04%, pretty low, right? So it's easier to get oxygen into our body than it is carbon dioxide because of these partial pressures are so high for oxygen. Nitrogen is not soluble though. Oxygen, very soluble. So carbon dioxide levels, we wanna keep them low though, of course, because we don't wanna increase the levels of carbon dioxide because that's increasing, which is not a good thing. We don't want that to increase. We want enough though for the plants Right, they're using all the carbon dioxide and giving off oxygen. Is that crazy? I just, I just every time, photosynthesis. Plant a tree. A tree grows in, Bro in Brooklyn, right? So exergonic reactions, back to this. The chemical reactions that give off energy in the form of free energy. So the products will wind up with less free energy. So that's a hydrolysis or a Okay, this is hydrolysis. This is actually glyco. Let's get this right. This is glycolysis. All right, we're breaking down in glucose. All right, into against the ultimate byproduct is going to be CO2 and water, but also ATP. Okay, so you might hear a term like glyco. Genolysis. What are we breaking down there? This is G, sorry. Glycogen? Yeah, we're breaking down glycogen, very good. So we're breaking down glycogen into glucose, glycing it. Then we could have, what if I said this? Uh, glycogenesis, I might have said this before, but what, what is this? Let's repeat it. What are we doing? 
creating glycogen? Yeah, we're, we're, we're synthesizing glycogen, dehydration synthesis, endergonic, right? Professor, does that, does that store water, the glycogenesis? As does it to re water? Reduce no, that, that's water? a loss of water. That's a dehydration. Okay. It's dehydration in the reaction, anyway, in the reaction. Okay, okay. Excellent. And, that, and there could be other things. There could be lipolysis. Right? Lipolysis. But most of the time, if, if or, or lipogenesis is another one. But if I say something like this, say I say something is anabolic. Versus catabolic, like as far as building bone or building muscle. If it's anabolic, I'm talking about building proteins. That's really the outcome there. So if it's building, building. And if I say catabolic, that's breaking proteins down. Amino acids are proteins hydrolyzed to amino acids, right? So that's catabolizing the protein. Make sense? So again, energy is used, energy is given off. Catabolic, more exergonic. Or anabolic, more endergonic. Catabolic, exergonic. Anabolic, endergonic. So just to know, it was, again, I had you memorize all the organic macromolecules. So we talk a lot about glucose and uh, lipids, steroids, and then proteins. So how different reactions in the body affect all those macromolecules and all the synthesis and dehydrations, right? Like how hormones are gonna affect that. Let's talk about it. Let's say, let's say a hormone like growth hormone, GH, which is secreted from your anterior pituitary and targets skeletal muscle and bones and all cells really. So just, just to think about this, is this anabolic or is it catabolic? Anybody with me? Growth hormone. Think about it. It's building muscle. Anabolic? It's very anabolic. anabolic. Very anabolic. Very anabolic. Very good. Very good. What about if I said estrogen? Catabolic or anabolic? This is a steroid lipid now. It's catabolic for sure. No, it's anabolic. Anabolic. Completely anabolic. anabolic. Completely. Completely. Completely anabolic. Yes. I mean, if I if I injected one of my mice with estrogen that may decrease their testosterone, of course, or it may just decrease their reproductive organs, but that's not completely inappropriate. That's experimental. But in the female, estrogen is completely appropriate anabolic hormone, for sure. Cool, cool. What about, this is a tough one, but th th stay with me here. What if I said insulin? Wouldn't that be catabolic? It's anabolic. It's anabolic, for sure. It's anabolic. It will help build proteins. But that's not the most important thing. So here's the question now, insulin. Anybody, everybody kind of know what insulin does? Insulin decreases your blood glucose. Insulin expediates glucose going into your cell membranes and being carried into your cells and into the cytoplasm. Lowers blood glucose. So. Isn't it a catalyst? For the carbohydrates uh, in a way, the carbohydrates. In a way, in a way, but I don't like to use that term. I like it, but I wouldn't use that term. Catalyst. So this is the question. Does insulin create glycogenolysis or glycogenesis? Glycogenesis. It does. Very good. Because it wants to store it. It doesn't want to increase the blood glucose. Because glycogenolysis would increase your blood glucose and break down glycogen, kind of the opposite. So there's like an, an evil cousin, like a Shakespearean antagonist called glucagon. I'll probably mention this a lot in this class. Glucagon, that's a C, sorry. Glucagon is the opposite. 
glucagon will increase glycogenolysis, which increases the blood glucose. So it'll decrease glycogenesis. It's kind of the opposite of our friend here, insulin, for sure. Uh, has no effect on uh, protein, really. One more, one more, then we'll move on. What about this one? You ever hear this one? Cortisol. This is a steroid released from your adrenal cortex. Cortisol, sorry. It could, you could say hydroxycortisone as well, but it's cortisol. It's a glucocorticoid. It's a glucocorticoid. But let me ask you this. Is this anabolic or catabolic? Catabolic. It catabolic. is. I like it. I like where you're going with this because basically this is the most catabolic of all these of all the steroids. It's a stress hormone. That's what they say. Yeah, it's a stress hormone. It's released in your stress response after, of course, your fight or flight. Because as I'm vaping in front of um, Chipotle, a coyote came after me. So the first thing, of course, is the norepinephrine release. But if I you know, if I keep reliving this every day and I have post-traumatic stress syndrome, then cortisol is going to be constantly released as an, as an anti-inflammatory glucocorticoid to help me deal with the stress. But then it just doesn't stop and it can be kind of uh, debilitating too much cortisol in your blood. But here, here's why. Here's one of the reasons why. So here's my last question. I know I like talking about hormones, but hey, these are reactions, man. Cortisol, right? Cortisol. It's catabolic. Does cortisol cause, and it's a glucocorticoid, does it cause glycogenolysis or glycogenesis? Glycogenolysis. It does. It does. And that's another problem with stress. Like Dr. Katz said, you know, if, if you have, you know, cortisol, glucocorticoids in, in, released into your blood, you're going to release more glucose into your blood and you're going to have hyperglycemia. Yeah. So again, we're not doing endocrine, but think how these reactions happen, how these things are catabolic, anabolic, especially when it comes to glycogen. And we'll revisit the growth hormone because that's really interesting what happens with the glucose. Interesting to me, of course. So check this out. This is the glucose, right? C6, H12, O6. Nice and neat. Monosaccharide, extremely organic because it's got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Nice ratio there, two to one. Hydrogen to carbon. It's amazing, right? And then you add oxygen, just six molecules of oxygen gas. Don't forget, we're not splitting this yet. That's not going to happen for a while, right? So this, of course, is busted down through glycolysis. Glycolysis is anaerobic. See, I get to talk about endocrine again, kind of, kind of. So we're still talking about energy. So there's multiple steps in this breakdown of, and it's combustion overall, of glucose in the presence of oxygen. Now you don't need oxygen for this. I'm so, let's take the oxygen, I'm sorry. So you will ultimately add oxygen after glycolysis, and that's aerobic respiration. So then you add oxygen, right? So you get to about here with glycolysis, which you make, you're gonna find out you make maybe, I think you only net about two ATP, two ATP with just glycolysis. But then you add the oxygen here, right? And then you're gonna go into, um, Again, there's some reactions between the products of glycolysis and what goes into the mitochondria. So now we're in the mitochondria. So within the mitochondria, we are using oxygen and we're going to, again, this book, I don't know what it calls it, but I used to call it the Krebs cycle. And it's the, also known as the car boxylic acid cycle. It has a couple of names. And this is in the mitochondria. And then that's going to make maybe another four ATP. And some of the products of the Krebs cycle are going to go into what's called the electron 
transport chain. Now you thought I got excited about photosynthesis. This is like the opposite here. This is really exciting. What happens here, oxidation reduction reactions with this little hydrogen guy, that's gonna make even more ATP. So how many did we make so far? Two plus four, that's six. It's gonna make another 32 ATP right in just from this chain. That's a lot. So that's like 38 ATP for one molecule of glucose. Not, not every cell does that, of course, like skeletal muscles will do that because they need ATP constantly. So each time a reaction happens within these cycles, you're gonna give off that free energy and it's gonna be used in the next reaction and so forth, so on. And ultimately one molecule of glucose is gonna give you not only 30, to ATP, but it's gonna give you six water molecules and get off, give off this carbon dioxide. So this is kind of a waste product that needs to get out, right? We gotta get that out of our lungs, right? We have to get that out of our trachea into the atmosphere. We gotta get it out. So if you have emphysema, it's gonna build up in the lungs. You have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and that will cause acidic blood. And then it really changes your cycles and reactions at that level. Yeah, let me just throw a mute on there. We're recording, right? I can't see the main screen. It looks like we are. I, I resumed recording. Good. Gotta have the recordings. A lot of hours in here. So, calories are energy. Usually, one calorie is the heat amount to, or the energy amount to increase one cc of water one degrees centigrade or Celsius. So we, we really, they're really K calories though. So it's a thousand calories that we're using. Okay, so that's a form of energy, calories. So we're, we're not really talking about uh, the BMR, right? BMR, basal metabolic rate, but that has a lot to do with the total energy we use for our body type and age and gender, ethnicity, I think is actually used here. And at rest, you know, like what our body needs just to just to get our reactions done per day. Make sense? And it's based on your demographics. BM. So can I recap? Can I recap on something real quick? Sure. Uh, that has to do with the energy steps. So yeah. in the beginning, at the top of the steps, you had glycolysis, which is Basically, the body breaking down the carbs into the pyruvate. Yeah, in the cytoplasm. The let, me, let me just add to that. Yeah. This is in the cytoplasm. Go ahead. This and is then, good. And then, and then, um, as it goes down the chain, it becomes more aerobic after, yeah. like that line with the oxygen, the mitochondria. Right. So that's the that Krebs cycle is the fatty acid oxidation cycle. The same thing, or is that different? no? No, it's a, it's a little different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we're not gonna, we're gonna, of course, this is not a biochemistry class. So we're not gonna go into every step of the Krebs cycle. You would never come back to this class if I made you do that. But you have to know what's gonna happen and how it happens and what the outcome is. And right now, this is the simple outcome between aerobic and anaerobic, you're getting all this ATP and the free energy on top of it. And the carbon dioxide is your, um, I like to call it a waste product. It's a byproduct though. Excellent point, excellent point. Thank you. So calories, again, talking about energy. So when we get, if, if we get back to you know, digestion or talk about BMI and BMR, then you'll know the biochemistry more or less what went on there. So in digestive, which we do, the energy that's in the food, you know, like nine K calories per gram of fats and four for each carbohydrate protein. So that's when you eat now. Now, now you have to see like a bank account, which how much energy you're gonna to need to put into your body to run your cycles on a daily basis, all right? And it takes energy to eat, right? I, I don't mean energy to go to Chipotle, but I mean like energy to digest. And that's also part of your BMR. So you see how much energy is given off to run your cycles. So basically this ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is a nucleic acid, right? It's a nucleic acid, it's adenosine with a ribose and a phosphate, base sugar and phosphate. It's a nucleotide. 
it's a storage form. It's a potential energy, we can call that. I like to call it that anyway. Because we have to hydrolyze it to use it for in an exergonic reaction. Okay. So producing ATP is endergonic because we're, what are we using? We're using a adenosine diphosphate just with the two phosphates plus that one inorganic phosphate. And that will give you the ATP. So this is a lot of stored energy in there. A lot. And there's a lot of ATP. Okay. So ATP is the, you, this is a new one for me, the universal energy carrier. I like that. Universal energy carrier. Like type O blood is the universal donor. I'm going to use that. Oh, we got a little gear wheel metaphor. I like it. So again, just the way this is running, reactants, the products, and this is an extra endergonic going in. So it's kind of using that energy to keep the wheel going. You're adding energy to the endergonic from what is released from the exergonic. So of course the exergonic has to be a bigger wheel, but that needs energy to run too. Right, and it runs off of a free energy. Entropy. Entropy. So look at this. This is you're not gonna have to draw this ever. Well, why not take a look? See, you know, you, you might know by now that this is a, a sugar or monosaccharide is the better way to say it. Five carbon sugar, which is actually ribose. Then you have your nitrogenous base. Here is your nitrogen, nitrogen, and this is adenine. And here's your three phosphates bound to that sugar. So this is a nucleic acid. One of the macromolecules, which we, again, we don't talk about it in, in food in Chipotle, but it's in food, nucleic acids, they are there and they're metabolized just like anything else. And they become part of your blood too. Uh, excess nucleic acids are a problem as well. So here's back to the cogwheel. I like it, All right? Food, glucose, All right? Glucose. This speaks for itself, I think. All right, so here's what's happening though. Here's your synthesis, your dehydration synthesis here, ATP or I'm sorry, hydrolysis, ATP broken down. And that's what this is showing. This is the opposite, I'm sorry. This is the synthesis going this way. But that needs energy. That needs energy. So this is oxidation reduction. Let's just get the definitions down because this is gonna give off this free energy. Is that Hydrogen electron jumps from energy level to energy level. That's basically what's happening in oxidation reduction. So when something's reduced, that's when it gains an electron. So let's just get the definition down. Reduction is gaining an electron. This is not ionic bonding, by the way. Think of a bigger molecule, organic molecule, especially. Oxidation, when a molecule, let's say more molecules, that could be an atom too, it loses electrons, so it's oxidized. Now, what does oxygen have to do with this? I mean, usually oxygen is the end point in an oxidation reaction, especially when we're building ATP in the mitochondria. But other molecules are oxidized. They're just called oxidation when it loses that electron. So basically, an, ox an oxidized molecule can help reduce another molecule, which you'll see. So the reactions are always together. That's why it's always, a, a, they call them redox or oxidation reduction reactions. So it's giving the electron to another molecule. Again, it's not loss and gain, it's not ionic bonding. We're not talking about that. So something that's gonna reduce another molecule is, is an electron donor. So it's a reducing agent. An oxidizing agent is the ones that receive the electron. 
that's a little confusing, but we'll have to break it down to what it is. So the, the two big ones are going to be, in, of course, NAD and FAD. We'll go into that probably a lot more next time. So oxygen, of course, is a great electron acceptor. And that's why they call it the oxidation. But it can be oxidized, which is very rare. And it only happens, I mean, it happens mostly in a place like the electron transport chain. And that's usable. Now, if oxygen, and I remember oxygen being split, all right, oxygen being split. If that happens in, in, in the other places in your body, you may get what's called a, a free radical, a free radical, which is kind of an unstable form of oxygen that could be damaging to your, to your blood vessels. You might've heard that. So you take antioxidants to reduce the oxidized oxygen. So it, it would be less dangerous, less uh, cause of cardiovascular disease or some types of cancer. So yeah, so free electrons are not passed along, but these hydrogen ions that are carrying the electrons. So it's the hydrogen ions that get involved in oxidation reduction reactions or redox reaction. So a molecule that loses that one electron, and we started the lecture with this, one electron hydrogen becomes oxidized. If it ha gets the electron, or hydrogen, hydrogen, it's reduced. So in this, NAD and FAD are now oxidized until they receive the hydrogen. Now they're reduced. And they could switch them back and forth. These could switch back and forth to FAD, oxidized to FADH, reduced, and so forth, so on. So it's kind of like this hydrogen, this electron is jumping from molecule to molecule just to go to a higher energy level and give off energy. And that's a crazy reaction. And this happens in the electron transport chain. And the NAD and FAD are, are one of the products of the Krebs cycle. And there are lipids involved, that's true. Okay, so- Is that why they say stay hydrated? What's that? Is that why they say stay hydrated? Stay hydrated, that's, oh yeah, you have to. That's one of the reasons, but there's many reasons. That's very good, that's very true. That would, you know, if you, again, if you, um, like, this is a really good question, actually. Like if you have um, dehydration, why do we have dehydration uh, normally? What could happen? Just sweating too much, maybe? Loss of water, you know, not replenishing the water? Fatigue. Tired. What, what is it? Your brain doesn't work properly. You get tired. Like, yeah, but why? Um, why am I dehydrated? You're expending too much energy. You're not replenishing. Yeah, it could be a replenishment issue. Yeah, for sure. But your your body is so in, incensed with keeping yourself hydrated, keeping your blood volume high. And these hormones are all about most of the hormones that are related to blood flow and kidney uh, reabsorption have to do with holding onto water, right? So, so anything that releases water is going to be what's called a diuretic. Have you ever heard of that diuretic? Um, like, uh, I guess coffee is a diuretic. Um, of course, Lasix is a is a uh, pharmaceutical alcohol loop diuretic. Alcohol. Thank you. Alcohol. So, like, like when when now when I went outside on the way back from. Chipotle, I stopped for a bottle of Tito's. I say, why not? Let's have some Tito's while we do the second half of the lecture. So there's a, a hormone released from your posterior pituitary called ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So alcohol pretty much shuts off antidiuretic hormone and then you wind up excreting more water than you need to. I never tried Tito's, by the way, but it sounds like something that would make me pee at night and excrete tea, coffee. water. Yeah, tea, coffee, theophylline, and tea, right? Could be a, a diuretic, but like the chemical diuretics, the pharmaceutical, like loop diuretics, sodium um, re releasing diuretics, Lasix, uh, I forget the other one, uh, thiazide, thiazide, hydrochlorothiazide, or 
diuretic. So that could dehydrate you. You could have, um, you could be losing blood internally or you're losing blood volume somehow, could cause dehydration. So that would make it, and this is Chris's point, that would make it difficult to run these Krebs cycles, right? And slow down the production of ATP and you'd feel <coughs> very lethargic, lack of energy, lack of uh, contraction. Good point, good point. So NAD is basically a B3 derivative, niacin B3, vitamin B3. This is a um, water soluble vitamin. Nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide, and this is the vitamins that we need. These are essential. FAD is flavin, or we call these flavonoids. B, vitamin B2, which is riboflavin, so flavin, adenine, dinucleotide. So these are really important coenzymes for reactions, especially in the Krebs cycle or citric, uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle, also known as a citric acid cycle. Important, let's put it this way, important for aerobic respiration. Now I'm talking about cellular respiration. I don't know if you guys understand what I'm saying here. Like there's anaerobic, which technically isn't using oxygen. So it's hard to say that, but it's gonna wind up in the aerobic chain anyway. So aerobic respiration involves oxygen in our cells to make ATP. And it happens to be that a byproduct of using that oxygen for um, aerobic respiration is going to be your carbon dioxide. And in, within the electron transport chain, you have this hydrogen transfer, this oxidation reduction reaction using these two coenzymes. And there's a lot of reactions that go on in the tricarboxylic acid cycle aerobically. And this really just leads up to the electron transport. So FAD can accept two hydrogens or electrons, because now hydrogen is donating its electron. So this is reduced FAD. And same thing with NAD, but NAD can only take one and has that extra hydrogen ion. So this is reduced NAD, All right? And it goes back and forth, really. This is oxidized with the H on it is reduced. So here's a hydrogen, basically, which gave up its, its electron at this point, just becoming hydrogen. Here's the molecules. Of course, you'd never have to draw these. But you can see like the oxidized state drawn like this gains the electron. Now it's reduced. So energy given off in these oxidation reduction reactions, which are reversible. It can go back either way. And FAD, basically the same thing. FAD in its reduced state. Oxidation reduction. Know the definitions for now. Oh, there you go. So NAD is an oxidizing agent and it becomes reduced. And the same thing here. Depends on what the other molecule is, which is could be any reaction, but we're, this is all leading to cellular respiration. You know, we'll, we'll use the glucose to make ATP. Let me just see if I can stop this. I gotta switch. To move on to cellular respiration, and remember, cellular respiration involves aerobic and anaerobic. But basically, the outcome is gonna be oxygen in, CO2 out. So that's probably why we can consider it respiration. So just to go through what we're gonna talk about here, you're gonna take the molecule of glucose and ultimately oxygen. So we're gonna, we know what glycolysis is and that's anaerobic in the cytoplasm. So this happens um, no O2, let's just say no O2, anaerobic in the cytoplasm.
then the products of that, basically, of the glucose, of glycolysis, now go into the mitochondria. And this is going to, there's going to be some reactions with acetyl-CoA and citric acid that's going to enter the Krebs cycle. Again, I'm not sure if your book calls it the Krebs cycle. It's probably more a tricarboxylic acid cycle or citric acid cycle. So again, Krebs cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle, and citric acid cycle are synonymous. And then the products of the Krebs cycle will go into the electron transport chain. So as I showed you before, in that order, glycolysis, a couple of ATPs, Krebs cycle, ATPs plus the NAD and the FAD. Entering those products into the electron transport, you're gonna make the most um, ATP, and this is where you have the proton pumping, energy levels changing, the redox, oxidation, reduction, reduction, oxidation, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so many ATPs. And again, not every cell does this the same, mostly skeletal muscles. And of course, the heart muscle, the cardiac muscle has to rely mostly on aerobic so this is all oxygen, aerobic here. So the heart muscle does not want to rely on anaerobic respiration. And smooth muscle relies a lot on anaerobic respiration. So that's a, that's a good point. Skeletal muscle is probably the most efficient in making ATP through both cycles, anaerobic and anaerobic. Cardiac muscle, more aerobic respiration, including oxygen in the process in the mitochondria it can do the anaerobic remember we told you before you don't want to have that that's not efficient and it's a sign of possible myocardial infarction smooth muscle mostly anaerobic and of all those three muscles smooth muscle is the most regenerative able to form its own pathways cardiac the least um, actual regenerating muscle tissue. So that's good to know, right? So here's glycolysis, which is going to in involve the lactic acid pathway, which is an ultimate breakdown of anaerobic. So this is, the, I got to say this right away, anaerobic, no oxygen needed. Okay. So just, again, so let's just introduce what's going on here. In, in words, right? We know what, I think we're good with what glycolysis is. I think that's, once you understand that, it can help you with other reactions. Lactic acid pathway is gonna take some steps. So again, energy transfer. And ultimately, what are we making by using this energy is ATP, which is that stored potential energy. So anabolism, I know I was talking about proteins before, but that was more of an endocrine situation, but anabolism is anything that um, builds up synthesizing, right? Synthesizing, they're kind of the same. So even if you're talking about carbohydrates, it's still anabolism, but catabolic versus anabolic in, in endocrine is I'm talking about proteins, like how it's breaking down proteins or building proteins. So catabolism basically is the opposite, breaking down something large into small. And that, and that could be proteins, that could be polysaccharides, could be ATP, right? Anabolic ATP would be ADP plus the inorganic phosphate to give you ATP with ATP synthase, dehydration synthesis. Catabolic would just be going the opposite. ATP broken down to ADP plus the inorganic phosphate. So that would be hydrolysis and catabolic exergonic. So the anabolic is endergonic, catabolic is exergonic. I think that rep repetition is good. Okay. 
So of course they it, it run. Now you got. I like to think about those cog wheels now, those gear wheels, one running the other. The free energy that's given off, like it, the the energy that's given off in an exergonic reaction, like uh, hydrolysis catabolism, will be used to build, right? Anabolism and ergonic, because you need energy for this one. So let's talk about glucose again. Catabolic reactions that break down glucose. And you can use all of these macromolecules, but really the one we want to use is glucose. I think we talked about this, like when we did um, your macromolecules, because primarily for this energy, you want to use your glucose. You run out of glucose, we use our stored energy, which are triglycerides broken down to fatty acids. Now, if we don't have any of those, and, and if you and if you use fatty acids, what's the byproduct that byproduct that could lead to acidosis? Anybody remember? Ketones. Yeah, you can get ketones from the, the breakdown of fatty acids, but you know it still works, and, and and sometimes it's completely appropriate. So diabetics, of course, can wind up in ketosis very easy because they can't utilize the glucose if they don't have insulin. I'll repeat that kind of a situation a lot. So if you're using amino acids for sources of building ATP, you're basically breaking down your own body. You're, you're cannibalizing your own body, you're using your muscle tissue, you're using you know, bone tissue, atrophying. And if, if this continues, of course, it's gonna start using heart muscle and diaphragm muscle and connective tissue. So again, starvation is, is an example of how that could happen. So anyway, using any of these, appropriately is going to involve a lot of these redox or oxidation reduction reactions. So of course we have Professor, to can I ask a, can I ask a question before you move on? If you're in a calorie deficit, do you, do you, you use fatty, you go into fatty acid acts. In other words, you, you, you go into ketosis. If yeah. In deficit, if it's extended it's use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, your body can convert something like lactic acid to glucose. So that would be the first way it would, it would work. Like it would use whatever lactic acid is in your blood first if you're starving uh, in a starvation situation, which is fine, which is fine. That, you know, that's using it. And then you can start using fatty acids, which again is appropriate to use that. And, and of course you, it's gonna be efficient. Um, just extended starvation of glucose <coughs> can cause ketosis if not done properly, right? So yeah, so again, this, that would be more starvation. Uh, using fatty acids primarily all the time would be something like being diabetic or on an extreme keto diet, right? So catabolism of glucose, that's glycolysis. And the oxygen is gonna be the final electron acceptor. So you're actually gonna oxidize the oxygen, are you gonna use oxidized oxygen, which is really miraculous in the electron transport chain. That's in the electron transport chain. So the catabolism of glucose, I, think I really have to have you understand this because this is kind of jumping here. Catabolism of glucose happens in the cytoplasm through glycolysis. It's no longer glucose after that. So now we're using either the anaerobic version of lactic acid or pyruvate, which you're gonna see. And then in the a Krebs cycle, electron transport. And that is the part that's called aerobic cellular respiration. So glycolysis technically is not aerobic, it's anaerobic and it's in the cytoplasm. The Krebs cycle is in the electron transport chain are part of the mitochondrial membranes and in between that utilizes oxygen. So oxygen ultimately is gonna be the, uh, the electron acceptor, really important. And I don't know how that happens, but it does. I don't know how the sun makes oxygen either with a plant and, and CO2. So, and glucose freaks me out, freaks me out. So again, breaking down glucose requires these enzymatic steps. And we'll go into that next time a little more deep. So let's just see what's going on first. The first of which are anaerobic. So that could be your lactic acid pathway and your glycolysis. Lactic acid is anaerobic, right? Let's remember that now. Like if you're, 
uh, we're going to talk about muscle metabolism. So let's get the picture here. Like I might have mentioned this before, but when we talked about the cell and we talked about blood and mitochondria and myoglobin. So let, let's, let's do two different things, two different ends of the spectrum. Like somebody who is training for cross country or um, marathons, right? And then you have somebody who's more training for sprinting, you know, 55 meter sprint or 100 meter sprint or power lifting, right? So everybody, every muscle you have and every body has it. I, I know the demographics of where the stork dropped you might, might make a difference in how you utilize different um, blood supply and organelles. But overall, every muscle you have has all different types. Every muscle group has all different types of fibers and the ability to anaerobically make ATP and aerobically make ATP. But if you're training for something that's more long-term, like something like a marathon, which of course would, even if I was driving, it would take me like eight hours, but some people could do it in normal people could do it in under four hours, right? And the elite athletes can do it under two hours, right? Which is crazy, right? So of course they're training the more aerobically, um, or more aerobic pathways, right? So the power lifter would be different. They're, they're training more the anaerobic pathways like um, glycolysis, of course, lactic acid cycle, but there's another thing called creatine phosphate, which is phosphate, right? It's making ATP. So it's directly phosphorylating ADP. So in a muscle group, you have fibers that contain both of those. So of course, the, the fibers that are, for, are muscle fibers that are more for posture, right? That, that have to contract more are gonna contain more mitochondria. They're gonna contain more blood flow. They're gonna contain more what's called myoglobin, which is a storage form of oxygen in skeletal muscle. So I'm talking about skeletal muscle because these are the most efficient at these, uh, these pathways. And of course the enzymes have to be working correctly. So the power lifter is using more of the glycolytic fibers, whereas the marathon runner, for instance, or triathlete, they're using more of the fatigue resistant fibers, or we term those slow twitch fibers. And they're darker. They contain more my mitochondria, more myoglobin, where the glycolytic, more for power lifting and, and um, sprinting, or lighter fibers, stronger fibers, thicker fibers, but less mitochondria, less blood flow. So there's two different types of fibers that in your muscles that undergo different uh, respiratory processes to make the ATP, right? Now I mentioned the heart muscle needs aerobic all the time because that's got to keep beating and beating. There's no rest, there's no oxygen repayment. So these, these actual cycles can run as they're needed as well. You know, and then of course uh, that was extreme. Like somebody who's a massive power lifting, you know, that's his life or her life. And then the marathon runner, which is needs more highly evolved or highly trained aerobic cycle, cycles. So they need more oxygen in there. Kind of makes sense. Just to see where we're going with all this crazy stuff. Right? So aerobic respiration, of course, mitochondria now, right, goes through glycolysis in the cytoplasm, and that's anaerobic. Just to keep repeating, you know, just to keep you going here. Oh, look at this. They call it the Krebs cycle. Not as old as I thought. Krebs cycle, citric acid or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And this occurs in where the, the matrix, and there's a good picture coming up, I believe, matrix of the mitochondria, and this is involving oxygen. So that's aerobic. And then deeper in the electron transport chain in the crista of the mitochondria, and you'll see what that is. It's the inner membrane because technically the mitochondria is a dual membrane organelle, aerobic. And I told you, remember the mitochondria has its own DNA. That's inherited only from your maternal side of the family, mom's side. Okay, so here's the formula. I think you can probably draw this. 
Paige is going to put this as a screensaver on their cell phone for the rest of the semester. So glucose, C6, H12, O6, probably know that by now, plus oxygen gas, which is O2. And this aerobic cycle will give you six carbon dioxide, which we have to get rid of. That's the, that's the payment we got to do. We got to get rid of that. Six molecules of water and then ATP. Now in a skeletal muscle, you can get, I'm going to just say for now, so different books say different things, but the 36 to 38 ATPs per one molecule of glucose and something like, well, let's just say skeletal muscle. Let's see the plant do that. I don't think so. A little visual. I love visuals. Again, this, this drawing is nowhere near as good as mine. By the way, you guys go to the Whitney, see all my drawings from the first uh, four lectures. You won't have to pay a cover, cover charge. Just use my name and you're good. Okay, so again, we're talking about glycogen. I love it. Glycogenolysis and glycogenesis. Because, of course, hormones are, are much more fun to talk about that cause those two things like insulin and glucagon, for example. All right, so we could eat, right? Chipotle, small intestine. Here's the um, jejunum of the small intestine. Here's the ileum down towards the bottom. So the small intestine is gonna, it has enzymes, enzymes that break down your carbohydrates, disaccharides, polysaccharides, like lactose, to smaller molecules, six carbon sugars, that are digestible and then get into the blood. Here's the blood. Look at that one layer of simple squamous epithelium, endothelium with a basement membrane, capillary. And so we talk about blood vessels now, it makes sense because it's diffusible, right? Simple squamous is diffusable. Glucose can get in, but it still needs a carrier, by the way. It still needs a carrier. All right. So in the blood, then it goes into the cytoplasm of the cell. And here's the carriers here for the cell. Because glu glucose gets in into a cell membrane with a protein carrier through facilitated diffusion. All right, so glucose gets into the cytoplasm. And by the way, there's a finite number of these carriers as well. Especially if your blood glucose goes too high, you're not going to be able to get the, the glucose into this into the cell. That's a problem with type two diabetes, where you just don't have enough carriers or you don't have enough receptors for insulin although you have insulin and type 2 with diabetes so once glucose gets in then you have the glycolysis which is the anaerobic pathway and one of the anaerobic pathways in the product of gly glucose or glycolysis i'm sorry is usually two pyruvic acid now if oxygen is not needed for to to move this into the, again, look now, it says citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle. If oxygen is not present the, or is not necessary, then it'll go into the lactic acid cycle. And this is also anaerobic in the cytoplasm. So pyruvic acid technically, not technically, definitely, is converted to lactic acid. So pyruvic acid is, and two of those, are breakdown of glucose in the cytoplasm through glycolysis. So lactic acid is a conversion from pyruvic acid in the absence of oxygen. So this is gonna make a couple of ATPs and lactic acid goes into the blood. And lactic acid, when necessary, can, can be converted back to glucose. Really good, right, if it, if it needs to be. Excess lactic acid is a problem though. And like Chris said, you need, you need to make sure you're hydrated when these cycles are happening, especially this one really important. It doesn't even mention creatine phosphate yet. And that's another molecule, creatine phosphate. You know, carrying that phosphate is also in the cytoplasm that could make ATP as well. Just adding one phosphate to it, you can make ATP. So creatine phosphate is a molecule in skeletal muscle. That's probably why it's not mentioned here because it's only in skeletal muscle. All right, that's probably why. That, that's only in the fi very finite amount, right? If you do it yeah. like the first few seconds. Yeah, it's there. It's always in the, in the cytoplasm of skeletal muscle cells, though. I think that's why they don't mention it so much here. But they mention it here, so it should be mentioned. Creatine phosphate is another a way that we can get ATP for muscle contraction. Because that, that's ultimately what we need in muscle, right? Just to shorten 
that piece, right? So if the pyruvic acid enters into the mitochondria, then we can start the citric acid cycle and the products of the citric acid cycle will enter the electron transport chain. And of course, this is all in the presence of oxygen everywhere, the mitochondria. And that's where you get those six CO2, six HE2O and some free energy in the form of heat. And you get all that AT, F and P, all right? So next time we'll go into the specifics and it won't be too bad. I won't, I won't hold you to like crazy amounts of enzymes and, and intermediate molecules that, that I